Joining me now is the Ronald W. Walters Endowed Chair of Race and Black Politics at Howard University. She was also the first black woman to become the gubernatorial nominee for a major party in the United States. I'd like to welcome Stacey Abrams. <laughs> Stacey, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I am well, thank you for having me. Absolutely, so we are here to talk about black women in politics. Um, and as we get started, I want to ask you the same question that I started our panel with, which is, do you feel that we are accurately represented in our political world right now? Not at all. No. No. Uh, part of representation is power. It is not only having the numbers, but it's having the ability to translate those numbers into lived experience, into policymaking. And we live in a time where black maternal mortality is at an extraordinary level. We live in a moment where our tax policies do not reflect the realities of our labor cycle. We live in a moment where the denial of access to health care is incredibly persistent in the region of the country where 56% of African Americans live, which means black women are being denied access to health care. And we live in a moment where this is the first generation to actually lose constitutional rights mm -hmm. since Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And for women of color, for black women in particular, the loss of bodily autonomy is dangerous to our economic future, our educational future, and it is an assault on our civil rights. And so, no, I do not believe that we are adequately represented. You know, one of the things that we often hear when we think about representation is we, we think about the federal level. We think about our White House, we think about our Senate and the House of Representatives, but how important is representation at our state and local levels? I began my political work at the local level. I was actually deputy city attorney for the city of Atlanta. And it was that experience that actually led me to run for state legislature, in part because I saw a mayor who attempted to solve hyperlocal issues often being thwarted by a state government that did not respect her responsibilities. We know that there is an intentional devolution of power from the federal to the state level. Again, it has been most acute when it comes to the issue of abortion and bodily autonomy, but it's happening across the board. That means that if you want to understand what is changing the policies or constraining your access to opportunity, it is at the state level. Uh, there is a bit of a stalemate at the congressional level. And so our opportunities for change, for power, for access will happen at the state and local levels. And again, because I live in the South, I'm always thinking about the fact that more than half of the African-American population, a fairly sizable number of people of color live in the South. And that is the place where the state policies are the most constrained, the most restrictive, and unfortunately now, the most intentionally damaging. We just saw what happened in Alabama. We saw what happened in Kentucky. Attacks on civil rights, attacks on our, our human rights are becoming more and more prevalent, and those are happening at the state level. Mm -hmm. We all know how important voting rights are for you. Um, so I wanna take a moment to talk about why voting, especially for black women, is so important, and just the power of black women voters. Absolutely. So I, I often say you know, voting is not magic. Voting is medicine. Magic, you do it once, ta-da, things are done. It doesn't work that way. Voting is medicine. There are ills in our society. There are challenges that we face. And we need to take the medicine to ameliorate the consequences to make us better. But sometimes the medicine is bitter. <laughs> sometimes it feels worse than the actual you know, malady that you face. But part of taking medicine is that you've got to do it over and over and over again. Because when you stop, often whatever you're facing will metastasize and get worse. And so we have to consistently engage in voting because voting in and of itself is not the point. It's not about who's on the ballot. It's about who's in the booth. It's about which people are making the choices and how do our lives improve. Because we live in a democracy, because we live in a nation where we elect people to make choices on our behalf, we can't hope that they'll do the right thing once we put them in office. That's like giving someone, you know, putting someone in charge of your store, giving them the keys to the cash register and saying, I'm gonna leave for four years, please don't steal anything. <laughs> and you know, please don't give your friends free stuff, don't take anything, and I'll be back in four years to check on you, but I won't look at anything you've done. I'm just gonna make sure that if the store hasn't burned down, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to let you stay. We wouldn't do that in any other place but our politics. And so for me, voting is about how we not only have accountability, but it's also how we demand access to our rights and our responsibilities. When we treat voting as an activity, then it's something you, it's one and done. I think of it as an action. It is something you do over and over again. And the more we do it, the better we get at it, the better we, we see the outcomes for the lives we want to lead. When we think about voter suppression, which we know is a huge top of mind issue for um, folks at the federal level, like our Congressional Black Caucus, um, to those at our state and local levels, we know that there is a huge push for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to be passed. Um, we know that voter suppression disproportionately affects black voters. So a little bit of a controversial question, but it, are black voters dangerous? The question presumes that the outcomes don't benefit everyone. Mm. When black people vote, when we have seen engagement and opportunity, we have seen progress for everyone. Think about Reconstruction. That was a time of economic surplus for a nation coming out of a war when we finally allowed African Americans to fully participate, even for a brief moment, we saw dramatic changes. We saw incredible improvements. We have seen that the locus of power often shifts away from those who can demand the most access and the widest aperture for others. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that your intention is to restrict and deny, then the answer could be, could be that this is not a group that you want. But if your goal is actually improving the lives of everyone, then black participation in voting is absolutely essential. I, I remind people that we have to remember our, our votes aren't just our voice, they are an instrument of power. And voter suppression happens in subtle and obvious ways. In the 19, you know, prior to the Voting Rights Act, it was very obvious. Now it's become much more subtle, although they're, they're revealing themselves more often. But voter suppression is, can you register and stay on the rolls? Can you cast a ballot? And does that ballot get counted? And so anytime you see any new legislation around voting, any new regulatory schemes, ask yourself, are they restricting your right to register or stay on the rolls? Are they creating any barriers to your ability to cast a ballot? Are they guaranteeing or undermining the ability for your ballot to get counted? That's voter suppression. It is no longer counting beans in a jar. It's shutting down polling places, restricting who can vote by mail. It is making decisions that limit your ability to be heard. And the reason they want you to be silent is because what you say is incredibly powerful. When we show up, we show a difference. And that's why our voices are so important. I want to uh, pivot very briefly because um, when you were a student at Spelman, you had gone to the board of trustees over tuition hikes. And I don't know if you remember um, talking about this experience, but you said when you were reflecting on it that we have to stop waiting for people to ask for our opinion. Can you just talk a little bit about why that idea of waiting for somebody to ask us what we think is so important, especially when it comes to black women? Uh, so as a student Spelman, I was on scholarship. I, I, I availed myself of all financial aid. And I found out tuition was going up, but they weren't increasing my scholarship. I wasn't going to be able to access a higher Pell Grant that year. And somebody was going to have to come up with the money, and I didn't have it. And so the instinct for a lot of my, co my colleagues in college, it was simply to grin and bear it. But for me, it was an existential crisis. My education was on the line. And I'd grown up in a family where my parents taught us, we had three jobs, go to church, go to school, and take care of each other. But what underlined all of that was your obligation to speak up, that you could not hope that someone would speak for you. Tele telepathy doesn't work. I've been practicing for 50 years. It has not happened yet. <laughs> and so if you don't speak up and demand what you need, if you don't speak up, especially for those who don't know they have the right to be heard, things don't change. And so for me, the conversation about democracy, about voting rights, about DEI, uh, mm -hmm. diversity, equity, and inclusion. These are all about how do we make certain that we are heard. If we wait to be invited to take our power, I promise the invitation is not in the mail. Mm -hmm. But if we demand our place, if we seize our opportunities, or in my case, and I think for so many, if we create our own opportunities, that's how we start to generate the change that we need to see. 
When I think about where we are right now, um, as I'm sure all of us are intimately aware of, is that we've, we've never had a black female governor in this country. Um, we've had only three black governors ever, all of them male, the most recent one being Governor Wes Moore being elected. But at the same time, I think about the strides that we as black women have made when we think about Vice President Kamala Harris, when we think about Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre, um, Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson. Where, where is our line? Where do we have to say we still want more? Do we, do we get to keep wanting more for those who are like, well, you've, you're in the White House, you're in the Supreme Court, what more do you need? We need as much as we can hold. Mm. That's our creed accord. That's what we should be demanding. Our place in this society should be equal to anyone else's. Uh, the reason I, I am so passionate about democracy, but also why I'm so proud of the work I was able to do as a candidate, was that me standing for office was not just about getting a job. That, I mean, it would have been lovely to, to have the job. But it was also about who could see themselves also asking for that power, mm -hmm. who could see themselves also demanding the right to move into a position, to demand that promotion, to simply get the respect they are entitled to. Uh, I, I want to see more of us because we should see that we are more than the least common denominator. Mm. And too often we are relegated to the worst stereotype or even worse, we are ignored. Our engagement in this society, our responsibility as black women in politics is to make politics work for everyone. And those who have faced the worst examples of bad politics are the ones who are best prepared to make it the most effective means of advancement and improvement. Ultimately, we are all in search of the American dream, and we can, con we can define that dream as we see fit. But we can't get there if we don't remove the barriers. And there is no one better to remove the barriers than the person who ran into it. Mm. And so for me, black women in politics is about how we lift this entire nation. And so no, I don't think we've gotten we, I, I am proud of every single person you named, but I know that the fact that you can name them is the problem. <laughs> we should be legion, and we should be so plentiful and so powerful that we are simply accepted as the right thing to do. Mm. When I think about some of the conversations that are happening right now, particularly I'm, I'm thinking of Nicole Hannah-Jones in her recent essay in the New York Times about color blindness being a trap. Um, and if you haven't read the essay, I, I highly recommend it. Um, but with that in mind, when, when we're looking at, as you mentioned, I can name these women, right? Yeah. Um, and that in and of itself is, is vaguely problematic that we can count them off on our, our you know, what, two hands. Um, will there come a day or should there come a day where we're able to say your gender, your race doesn't matter to be able to represent? Or do we want to keep that in mind in order to say, but I, I know those barriers and what we had to overcome? A few years ago, I wrote an essay for the, um, for the Council uh, for Foreign Affairs on identity politics. Uh, identity politics is perfectly acceptable unless they don't like your identity. Mm. And when we hear about class, yes, when we hear about women, when we hear about business, those are all identities. Why are I, our identities any less relevant? Representation matters because representation is the avatar for understanding what preceded that moment. If you don't understand what's wrong, you cannot make it right. Therefore, representation is absolutely important. And there should never be a moment where representation is diminished. The question is how much power should it have because there is so much difference in what you get. So our issue should not be the fact that people cling to identity. It's the fact that we allow identity to distinguish your access to power. That's why the fight over DEI is so important. Right now, there is this very reductive narrative that DEI is this recent phenomenon on college campuses that has to be you know, stamped out. DEI describes every single movement we have had since the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. Any opportunity to move this country forward, reconstruction, suffrage, the Chicano movement, the disability movement, the LGBTQIA movement, the labor movement, those are all diversity, equity, and inclusion movements that exist because that's how we make our country better. 
our representation matters because it's the way we get to the American dream that we've all been told we are entitled to. Mm -hmm. So either we change the ethos of this nation or we change the process mm -hmm. that makes it so. And my intention is to change the process. That's why I work so hard to make certain we can all vote, that we can participate, and irrespective of who we vote for, you should have the right to be heard. But representation in that is absolutely essential because you cannot solve problems you don't acknowledge. And more importantly, you won't solve the next problem if you don't have the experience of having solved one before. Mm -hmm. We have a few more minutes, but I do want to offer our students, our audience, a moment um, if anybody would like to ask a question. We have a microphone right over here. Uh, hello, my name is Camila Armas. I'm a freshman political science major from Howard University. And my question is that there was a lot of hope for the Biden administration and the Congress coming into 2020 in terms of making positive policy, policy change. And a lot of people are disappointed in the seeming lack of results. So where does policy change that will most affect the issues black women and other minorities face happen? On a local and state level, or is there still hope for the national level coming into 2024? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So I would, I would say that we have seen dramatic improvements, uh, because I want us to remember what 2020 was like. I know a lot of us want to forget, but 2020 was hard. And since that time, we have seen dramatic action, not only on climate change, on attempts to make sure we expand job opportunities on health care. We had a child tax credit that got taken away. So what we've got to remember is what was and then what disappeared. There were moments that were instituted by the Biden administration and by that Congress that when the congressional makeup changed, those changes disappeared. And so we cannot eschew federal engagement. And we should always hold to the reality that even though we get what we want, the other side gets what they want to. And so it's a constant tension, and our obligation is to make sure we're a little bit further ahead than the other guys. So my, my very strong sentiment is that we have had a successful administration that can't get everything done because there's a lot to do, which is why they're asking for four more years. But putting that aside, what we also cannot do is think that every problem gets solved at the federal level. That is why my focus is so assiduously on state politics, because we know that for most Americans, the choices about education, about the economy and about elections is not federal. It's actually state. It's either because of a stalemate at the federal level or because they've already devolved that power to the state and local governments. And so we've got to have a both and approach, both state and local and federal. But when we decide to focus on one to the exclusion of the other, the people who are fighting against our advancement are going to take the power of that other space and use it against us. So we've got to look everywhere all the time. Thank you. Absolutely. Hi. I see you too, so Ooh. go ahead and stand behind her because <laughs> you, you keep popping up and down. Hi, my name is Taylin Sharp. I'm a student at Georgetown University, and I'm also with Codex. I have a question. Um, you, po you focus heavily on grassroots and local politics. Can you expand on some of the obstacles that black women find in running for local politics, and can you expand on the importance of black women in these roles? Thank a you. Absolutely. Black women have to be represented at every level of politics because we live at every level of lives. Like we, we don't simply exist in the federal ether, ether. Sorry, we do not simply exist in the federal ether, and therefore we have to pay attention to what's happening to our children or to ourselves in an educational setting. That's local politics. We have to understand what's happening with bodily autonomy. That's state politics. We have to know who gets access to funding for capital, for our jobs, and for the businesses we want to start. That's state and local and federal. We've got to pay attention to the constraints on our ability to grow our opportunities. That happens at all levels. And so I started the grassroots because when you can create the strongest team, those teams then send up your players. I and mean, it's kind of like a farm team. Sorry, I use a lot of sports analogies. Um, but if you only have one person at the local level, that person may not make it all the way up. That's why you need as many as possible starting at the most easily accessible level, but it's only easily accessible if there are resources. It's hard for black women to raise money, in part because it's hard for black women to ask for money. It's hard to make it through the political systems that give you the right to know that you can ask for money. I operate in a space where I just don't ask for permission. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I ask for forgiveness, but even that sometimes. <laughs> 
part of it is that we've got to own our authority to do what needs to be done without needing other people to say it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so we should run for office when there's an office open, but we should also help our friends run for those offices. And we have to lower our barriers to entry where we expect you to be perfect before you start. Mm -hmm. If they can learn on the job, so can we. Mm -hmm. And we can learn at each level of the job. And it's not just about who's holding the office. It's who's the chief of staff, who's making the phone calls, who's writing the press releases. Because the way we tell our stories often determine how our stories are heard. And so we've got to build not just the candidates for local office. My grassroots work has focused not only on who's running, but who's running the campaign, who's running the staff, and who's running their mouth when you are not in the room. And if you think about all of those places, that's how we grow our capacity to run for everything and one day run everything. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Gabrielle Draper. I'm a senior psychology and political science student at Howard. Um, and my question kind of revolves around the mental health aspect. Um, I read recently in a book by Congressman Raskin that if you don't have constituents who are well, um, you're not going to have constituents who are voting. And so I'm curious as to how, you know, in your work to promote more engagement um, in voting on the state level, um, really at every level, but uh, how can we address the mental health aspect and really give people just the self-autonomy um, to actually get to the polls themselves and really know that their vote matters? Mm -hmm. So I think there are two component pieces to that, and I appreciate the question. One is a structural issue. Uh, again, I, I reference the South a lot because it is emblematic of so many of the broken pieces that we have in our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The absence of Medicaid expansion in Southern states means that millions of people are denied access to mental health care because embedded in the Affordable Care Act and therefore in Medicaid expansion is access to that mental health support. Coming out of COVID, out of the pandemic, there was never more, there was never a more acute moment than the proof that we needed holistic health care. And yet entire re an entire region of the country is continuing to deny access. And so we've got to demand that our governments actually provide access. I live in a state, the state of Georgia, that is willing to spend $26 million to, to provide access to 3,000 people, 3,500, let me give them credit, as opposed to accepting billions of dollars to serve more than half a million people. Mm -hmm. It is a decision that is a disgrace. And the mental health component is absolutely a key reason that we have to make certain that healthcare is expanded across this country to everyone. And then there's just the, the daily trauma of living. And part of what I tell folks when you're trying to engage voters, lectures don't work. No one has ever been lectured into action. You just do it because you're tired of hearing it. But the lecture itself is not what creates the change. But our job is not to lecture. Our job is to ask, how can I help? What is hurting you? What do you need? If you want to convert someone from non-voting to voting, or if you want to change their vote from one side to the other, ask them what they need and then listen to their answers and help them find solutions. Uh, my teams, whenever I run for office and whenever I, I'm in office, their job is to say, how can I help first and foremost? Because if you start with that, you create a sense of empathy, but also you create an action-oriented behavior. You can, I can help you but I need you to help yourself by showing up to make certain that I'm in a position of power to make that help real. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to give a big thank you to you for joining us today. Um, again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Stacey Abrams, Ronald W. Walters, Endowed Chair of Race and Black Politics at Howard University. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that.